until you uh, until you, if you play a game where you can transform into a werewolf creature and you're constantly kicking the enemies in the nards. Yeah. You don't understand retro. Yeah. Sonic Unleashed. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the many modern misconceptions surrounding retro games and what about them is and isn't worth preserving. Plus, impressions of Metroid Other M, Metal Frame Zero, and Lifeline Silent Night. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 61 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, I'm back. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today, our media topic of discussion is going to be uh, retro games, and more specifically, the way that retro games are kind of done today. You know, we have a lot of indie developers and even some big-name developers who are coming out with these games that... Um, at least look retro. Um, sometimes they're touted as being retro. Uh, but we want to go a little bit into kind of what that means and um, whether or not there's actually something more to that or if it's just, you know, playing up the nostalgic chip tune and pixelated graphics. Yeah, is there more to retro than what the game looks like, what it sounds like? Does it matter what it plays like? So it serves at 11. You <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned and we'll find Stay out. Stay tuned. You kids want me to school you is what you're saying here. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Yeah. Go with that. the old guys uh, on board. What was the topic again? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> See, it was an old joke. <laughs> yeah, ah, let's yeah. let's That's get true. on with the show. <laughs> get ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, I have a game I want to talk about for sure in Bud and Mosh um, today, and it's actually a game that came out about six years ago, but I've never played it um, because I heard a lot of bad things about it called Metroid Other M. Ah, yes. And it was actually the last Metroid game that came out. Um, so who was the first M? Who was the first M? Yeah. Um, I believe the M refers to a Metroid, but I'm not that far in Oh, so this is the other yes. Metroid. This is just the game called Metroid Other M. I never understood the title. I was I, don't I was half joking. And I still don't understand it. So You're playing it and you don't understand no. that. That's a good But sign. I'm not that far into the game, to be, to be honest okay. with you. Okay. So, well, what are um, your first impressions, then? My first impressions are it's it's absolute dog shit, and I can't even believe it. I, I, I guess I had to curse a little bit there, but I think it's warranted. Um, Nintendo, I don't even know how they could have released this game. I, I would feel, if I was one of the designers on this game, I would feel embarrassed when it came out. This is wow. how bad it is. That's a, strong, that's a very strong reaction, because normally I don't have a reaction quite that strong. Why? Gameplay or writing? or Everything. Everything Damn. is bad. And now, I see, I'm, I've heard like my fair share of critiques, and I had my fair share of critiques over the writing and the story presentation and stuff like that, um, although there were some parts of it that I did like. But the gameplay, I thought, was actually a really interesting, fresh take on Metroid. It was, it's, it's different from all the other Metroid games, and well, so let, if different is bad, then yes, it was bad. Let, but let me I think tell you why. It, it sort of captured some element of action that I think has been kind of lacking from certain Metroid games. Really? That's an interesting comment, because I'll tell, you, I'll tell you my experience with the gameplay so far. And like I said, I'm not super far into it, so that could change. But I started, I loaded the game up. The first thing that happens is there's like a, about a five to ten minute cutscene. Very first thing. Uh, it's one of the things I hate the most in games. Then right after the cutscene, um, now you're in this training area, and you have to learn how to use all of your abilities. Ooh. So it's a long tutorial sequence. The other thing that I hate the most about modern Unskippable games... Unskippable. So, of course. Yeah. So right off the bat, it, has, it commits the two cardinal sins of modern gaming. This in a series that is all about, one, teaching you how to explore the area and learn how to use learn your moves as you gradually go. as yeah. you go, which Metroid has been known for mm. since the start. And it always does an excellent job at and two, having environmental storytelling is a big part of the Metroid mm-hmm, series. Mm-hmm. You learn about the world around you and the story that's being told through your experiences in the game and through the environment. You don't get told everything. Well, not only are these cutscenes, I need to explain a little bit about the cutscenes, because they're not just cutscenes. If they were, it'd be annoying, but there's more to it. It's 90% of the cutscenes, during the cutscenes, is Samus Aran's inner monologue, so she's just constantly talking. Mm. 
This is, of course, the first time she's actually had a voice. She's just constantly explaining things, and she explains things that are so obvious, it's absurd. <laughs> like, at one point she says, um, oh, we're, I'm in this dangerous environment, or something like that. And I'm thinking, this after we'd just been attacked by all, all these monsters. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, why did you need to make that comment? Like, who, what writer is thinking, I need to in- reinforce that I'm in a dangerous environment? You've just been attacked by monsters. Or... The, and of course, the other thing that really annoys me, and this happens shortly after you get into the game, you think that you're about to start the game. This is where the gameplay comes in that Chris was talking about. You get into the game, you're in this sort of like 2.5D world. It's like, uh, I can best compare it to Super Mario 3D Land, or Super Mario 3D World. Really? I didn't know that. Yes. So it's like, you're you're sort of in 2D, but you can kind of go into the environment some, so it was that, is that a fair comparison, you think? Yeah, I'd say so. But yeah. they, they sort of transition in a way similar, I'd say, actually, to um, some of the newer Sonic games, where you have sort of side-scrolling segments that that's like original Metroid. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. But yeah, I'm kidding. But, 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 that's, but, then, that's but then there are also parts, like, especially when you get into fights, like, they kind of put you in, like, almost these arenas, I guess you can call them, where it turns into sort of an area where you can move around uh, up, down, left, and right. Yes. Like, on a flat surface. And, um, that's where, and that's where the aiming comes in, and that's actually where... I feel like the gameplay, because you, you talk about the action elements too, mm. but I feel like that's where the gameplay really takes a hit. Mm. Because you don't really, like, yes, you sort of push the, the, the D-pad, and you, by the way, you control this with just the Wii remote itself. Mm. You don't use the nunchuck. So it's a Wii game. So, um, yeah, Wii game. So um, I, I was playing around. I, you just kind of, like, touch the D-pad in the direction that you sort of think the enemy is, kind of. Mm. And then it sort of kind of auto-targets you at mm. that enemy, sort of, but not really. <laughs> so it's just, it really feels janky and not very precise. Um, that's one thing. The other thing that I don't like about it is there's also these sequences where you have to point your your remote at the screen mm-hmm. in order to go into, like, first-person mode mm-hmm. so that you can, one, scan the environments. Why? So they brought back the one thing that I actually thought that Metroid Prime should not have done with Metroid. I love Metroid Prime. Mm. The one thing I didn't like was all the scanning because it took away from that, you trying to, to figure out, okay, what do I think that the world is saying to me mm. through the environment and all that, it, and, and it just turns it into explaining it to you. Mm. So one element of Metroid Prime here they didn't like. That's the, one, that's the only thing that they brought back. So I'm like, <laughs> well, thanks a lot, guys. The only thing I, I didn't want you to bring back is what you bring back. I actually kind of like that bit, but that's just me. Well, but it, it felt unnecessary there in a game that, is now, that isn't first person. Why feel like you have to mm. include that? The other thing that I that I really hated right away, and this is a major part of the gameplay, because gameplay is more than just about how it controls, it's about the way it presents itself, mm-hmm. is one, that element that you talked about where the enemies are inside this sort of large open space arena type thing, mm-hmm. and you kind of run around and try to defeat them. To me, that doesn't feel like Metroid. It feels like almost this this totally different actioning kind of game. And that's what I think was interesting about it to me, though, is because it doesn't, like, to your point, it doesn't feel like Metroid, and I will give you that. But I did like that because I've seen, like, you know, for instance, you know, opening cinematics in other games or other portrayals of Samus and other things, other media, other games even, that kind of sort of show her as more acrobatic and able to jump around and do, like, this really cool sort of combat stuff. This kind of captured I like the jumping. The one thing I actually like is the jumping. I liked I liked the way the jumping feels. I like the way that the um, wall jumping or they call it like kick jumping or something. Mm. I like the way that that is incorporated into the game. So yeah, some of the, and I like the way that they incorporated some of the platforming elements. Mm. There's things I like about it, but it's it's the way that that controls and I, and it's not so much about the way that the enemies attack you in those open environments that mm. I dislike so much as those environments feel so boring. Mm. Like they don't feel like in the other Metroid games. There's all these platforms everywhere and you, and there's enemies all over the place and it feels like the enemies are just. There, there are aggressive enemies in the game, mm-hmm. but in in a lot of the enemies in Metroid games are not necessarily aggressive enemies per se. They're just creatures that live on this planet that if you get too close to them will react. Uh-huh. If, if that makes sense. Does yeah. that kind of make sense yeah, to you? Yeah, I think it does. Whereas all the enemies in other M, they come right at you. Mm-hmm. So it has this very different feel to it that I, that I think kind of goes against... Um, some of the core concepts yeah, of Metroid. Yeah. Plus, they have this this other part of it that I absolutely hate. Um, it just goes into the story. Mm. So one of the first thing people that you meet when you come into this new area, um, the space station, um, you run into this this group of like soldiers or what have you, and one of them takes his mask off, seems to recognize you, and then he calls you Princess. <laughs> so you're this badass bounty hunter. Samus Aran, and the first codename Princess. Codename Princess, and then another well, another is... one calls you Lady constantly. Yes, I understand, Chris. That part of their story, they yeah. know just because they can justify it within the story doesn't mean it's a good idea. <laughs> so I'm getting that. good writing. That, yeah. Right, that's what I'm getting at. So yeah. I understand if, if there's a justification there. But the other thing is that that 
right off the bat, okay, this is kind of a metric invention. You lose all your powers, you have to get them back. Right. Well, the problem here is that instead of having you lose your powers... You get authorization. Yes. Yeah. Basically, Adam, who who somehow becomes your, your boss for basically no reason, he doesn't even have a cool super suit. He's, he's your former CEO, and now you're not right. affiliated with the Federation anymore. But, yeah, former being the key word there. Yeah, but you're choosing to cooperate with the Federation team that's there. So you're For willing... no good reason. <laughs> There's, they give you no reason why you need to cooperate with them, by the way. You don't need to. It's the same as his choice. But it doesn't make any any sense as a, she's as a secretly in love as with an him. independent probably so it wouldn't surprise me as an end because the way that the way they're portraying in this game as an as an end it's supposed to be father figure thing but yeah right it's Japanese well um, there's also this de- element of um a, a, a Metroid other M M O M mom yeah you know people oh talk all the time about oh like the, the motherly symbolism in this because of the Metroid and all this if I have stuff, to hear her say so. baby one more time I'm gonna rip my hair out and I'm, I'm only about an hour and a half who's she calling baby game. the baby Metroid oh from okay. Super Metroid okay. Um, anyway, so I don't want to harp on this for too long, yeah. too but I, I'm, I'll, I'll report back when I play more in the yeah. game. But I, I, I will say that, like, especially if I was to go back and play it now, because I did play it when it first came out, um, I had my fun with it. I'd probably have more issues with it now than I used to. Um, and I definitely see all the arguments from like a narrativist perspective, all this different stuff, why there was a lot of it wrong and how it really does break the spirit of Metroid in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I think it did a few a few things well enough that I think it's kind of worth checking out. I, I think it did a few things well, true, too, but... Forget the Metroid connection. I actually think it's a st- legitimately bad game. I'm going on the record. Forget mm. Metroid. I think it's a bad game for, for all the reasons that I've already described. I you think said you found it in the bargain bin, though, right? I did. I paid nine bucks for it, and I think I overpaid. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so look for it in your local bargain bin. <laughs> Don't pay any more than five bucks. That's what I'll say. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That gives us a hard, fast number, too. Yeah, that's how we need to start rating all of our games. Just, uh, I would in pay the amount we would it. pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> none, of, none of this 9 out of 10 crap that you get on you know, IGN and stuff. Yeah. No, no. It, it's a, this is a $4 game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, this is a $10 game. No, this is totally a $60 I, I've game. Seen, I've seen a few people before use the um, don't bother, rent, or buy system. Oh, yeah. Which I actually think yeah. is not a bad one, either. Yeah, that's like the date. You know what? Never mind. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Okay, this is going to be a little strange, I admit, but a couple of years back, there was a Kickstarter. Maybe you remember it. It did really well. It was called Mobile Frame Zero Rapid Attack. That's the one with the Legos, right? Yeah, it's the one with the Legos. And what you do is you get out your Legos, the ones that are in the closet, and you look for all the rare pieces, because that's what it takes (laughs) to do this, and you build mechs. Uh, what they call frames, mobile frames. And you physically get out your Legos you and build them. You physically get out your Legos. You physically build them. You physically put them onto a table. You make some terrain, which Lego is also very good at doing. Um, and you're not really doing it at minifig scale. You're doing it at a slightly smaller scale. Mm-hmm. So if you can imagine um, a one-by-one one round with uh, a one-by-one one flat up on top of it, mm-hmm. that would be a, a human, right? Okay. That would be a person okay. Um, okay. with a little hat. <laughs> and so that's your scale. Work with that scale in mind, and what you've got is giant robots. mechs, giant mechs, nice. right? Mm. Um, it's a pretty amazing game, though. And what's what's really cool about it is that um, Mobile Frame actually has a robust history. It's this is about the tenth edition of the system, and it's the first one that has destructible mechs because that's the beauty of it. That's, that's interesting. I didn't know it was actually an existing system. Yeah, this. yeah, <laughs> it is. It's just not a very big popular one. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, here's the thing: with all the the fizz repping that you did before, you couldn't rip the arms off. Whenever our mechs get into combat with each other now, um, and I blow you up, um, I can take your Lego and I can do horrible things to it, right? <laughs> I can pull it into, into parts. I can blow the, um, blow the arm off that has the big cannon. You can no longer use your cannon. Nice. So I'll give you the system in, in real simple terms. The first thing that's really important is there's four or five different types of dice that you need to have, and they're color-coded. So mm-hmm. you've got to have white dice, which is for your frame itself. But then you also need to have some yellow dice, and that's for any kind of a spotting system or a visual system. Are these all D6? Yeah, they're all D6s. Do you um, make the dice out of Legos? No, you, well, you could. They, <laughs> you have, could, they have Lego dice. <laughs> um, but uh, the, then you've got um, blue systems, um, and you've got red systems. The red systems are actually the weapons, um, and so on and so forth. So what, you, you're rolling these different dice of these different colors with these different systems on your mech. You can put up to four systems on a mech, um, and you can actually double up two of the same kind. So I can have a long-range system uh, for attacking what, what they call artillery range. Mm, um, I mm. can have a, a close range. I can have melee range, all of that stuff. 
and I can choose what type of bot I have. So I can actually field something that has no weapons at all, but is out there in order to be a spotter. Hmm. And it rolls, in that case, it would roll 2d6 and a d8, because it's oh. some d8s as well. Oh, because you built, you have a team of mechs. Mm -hmm. You have a team of mechs. Oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't get that part. And, and you can do, I probably didn't say it. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do it on skirmish level, or you can do it on battle level. You can do it to five players. Um, three players apparently works really, really well. Um, I haven't had a chance to do it at that scale yet. Now, how many people, how, like if you're doing like say three on three, how yeah. many mechs does each person have? Well, it depends. There's actually a chart. And the beauty of the thing is you can have a range. So you can say, I have up to two, or I have between two and five mechs that I can choose from. So here's the thing. I build my army, as is the tradition with army building games, right? Mm -hmm. You build your army. We come to the table. Your army outnumbers my army. It has more systems. It has more mechs. It has more whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So guess what? I get the tactile advantage. Because you have more points than me, it's going to literally change the way we set up and who's after who. Then as soon as um, the the attacker brings the defender down below points, it switches. Hmm. And it can switch literally in the middle of a roll, in the middle of a turn. You can switch and so you can have to go on the defensive. Huh. It's wonderful. And hmm. there's rules in there for campaigns. There's all kinds of really cool stuff. Lots of, lots of house rules, mods, that kind of a thing. Uh, so the thing that I absolutely love about it, uh, the thing that's most amazing is you can just download the rules for free. Um, the Kickstarter itself had a stretch goal, which was if we get so many backers, so much money, whatever, we're just going to release the PDF for free. And they hit it, they did it. Nice. Um, hmm. So you can just download it, grab your library, play tomorrow. Uh, well, it'll probably take you a day or two to, <laughs> to build the things. But, yeah. Or maybe a couple uh, of trips to the Lego store. Yeah, the Lego store, you know, whatever. Uh, but um, no, you, you can download it. And, and the recommended price is 10 bucks. Once you download it, if you don't immediately go back and pay the ten bucks, you're a bum because it is absolutely <laughs> worth it. Nice. It is is worth every. And and I'm seriously considering getting the the hardbound version of it just because it it looks amazing. Mm. Um, that said, they've got a new one that's coming out or had just come out, uh, which is ships. So basically, if if you're ever um, played like Battlefleet Gothic, you remember that old game, um, the the ship scale very very different, same universe. When, when you say ships, are you talking? Ships that fly through outer space, or ships yeah. that are on the water. No, massive, okay. um, massive spaceships on. Uh, and uh, is this space battle like Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Wars, Star Wars. So it's more, more like, like fighter jets in space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I haven't played that one. And that one, I don't think they hit the same goals, so they haven't released the PDF. Mm -hmm. But um, if it's any, if any indication, uh, based on the beta that I've played. Um, it's totally going to be worth it, too. So, um, anyway, check it out. It's called Mobile Frame Zero. Um, I am super excited about getting a league going. Mm -hmm. So, um, when that happens, I'll keep you updated. Nice. And one quick question I have before we wrap this up. Yeah, um, sure. Do they give you instructions on how to build the mechs, or is it kind of just build whatever mech you want? Oh, to? that's a fantastic question. The answer is yes. Uh, the core system actually comes with five or six instructions, but here's the thing that I've found. There's such a strong community of it. If you go to places like the Mobile Frame Garage and go to their forums there, people have used the, the Lego tool for creating uh -huh. instructions, um, and they've put their own mech designs up, and some of them are really, really fantastic. Nice. Uh, Mitten Ninja is like my favorite. He's the coolest dude ever. Mm -hmm. um, and they look very, very Gundam styled nice. um, and you know I'm not a fan of Max I'm not a fan of of, of Japanese oh, I know out, like, yeah. I know <laughs> but um, it, the, the truth is um, but you probably, I'm all like, this. you probably like building them though you may not be a fan of watching shows with them but you like the idea of putting actually them together, yeah right not only so. that but fielding them and blowing them apart yeah, so, yeah. exactly so. um, but no I just so I've never been a fan just of a I'm different a fan. sort it's, I've just never been a fan of the fiction uh, <laughs> of the fan fiction uh, <laughs> anyway yeah um, it's a great system it's a lot of fun this is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. Yeah, so uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I noticed on uh, the Google Play Store they had released the, the sequel to Lifeline, which was a game that we had talked about, uh, like a story-driven choice, almost like a choose-your-own-adventure yeah, kind of game. that was one of the greatest things I played last mm -hmm. year. Where they, where they essentially have characters on this alien world. It's very, it's very reminiscent of both Planet of the Apes and Alien. Um, maybe some Doom thrown in that oh, kind of, yeah. that, sort of a world. That's a good way to describe it. Um, and it's it's all this character directly talking to you and asking you for advice, and so that's how you're making choices for for him. And it's you know one or two very binary choices. Um, Taylor. Taylor. Its yes. name was Taylor, <laughs> which of course is the the main character from yeah. Planet of the Apes. So, now, so to clarify, because we were talking about this before we started, this is not Lifeline Two, the one with the mage girl. 
This no. is another. Yes, yeah, so no, I played that. And I liked that one, and that's what I'm getting. But it's very different. Yeah, the one that I was just describing was the first one. Right. So this Lifeline. new one is yes. So this new one is 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 a direct sequel to the first one, okay. but it's not the second Lifeline. It's Lifeline three, but they call it Lifeline Silent Night. Merry Christmas. Ooh. And it all takes place on a ship. So it also has a connection, a even closer connection, honestly, to Alien, and by that I mean the very first Alien. Yeah, that's true. Um, you're on it. You're on a ship, and there's you know alien creatures. Go kind of, mm-hmm. but it sort of it takes a very different um, approach. I thought to the way that it presents you with choices. I mean, aside mm-hmm. from yes, it still talks to you and asks you for your input, but to me, this felt a lot more on rails than the first one. What, yeah. do, what do you think, Doc? Yeah, I got the impression that there was a right answer and a you just died answer. Yeah, um, and I also got the impression that there were a lot of fake outs mm-hmm. where my choice really didn't matter. It was stupid answer A, stupid answer B. I got that a lot, especially when you're having conversations with other characters. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of, he's kind of just going to do whatever he wants, and you're just sort of commenting on what's happening. Yeah. You know, the thing that irritated me in that game, actually, was that he would would criticize you. Oh, yeah. He was saying, "Will will you please stop saying these critical things of me? And then your only two responses were critical. (laughs) <laughs> it was like oh, I have no choice. I've got this binary choice that isn't a, even a binary choice. It it felt more like that the they weren't necessarily story choices. Like the first ones at least felt like story choices in mm-hmm. the first life mm-hmm. I mean. But in Silent Night, they felt more like um commentary on the game, like they were just dialogue yeah. choices. Yeah. And even though in both games you're you're talking to a character or he's talking to you and then you're responding it felt more like a conversation the second time where you're just sort of commenting on what's happening as opposed yeah. to you're giving him advice, do this or do that. Yeah. Well, you know, I kind of wish, speaking of, uh, like, like we have been, the, the, the Telltale style mm-hmm. story games, mm-hmm. um, I wish there was a way that it could have read my old data and known my old choices oh, yeah. so that it would know whether or not the captain was alive or not, mm-hmm. uh, that kind of a thing. And, and maybe the, what they need is an app that you load up the stories in mm-hmm. Moving forward, obviously they can't do this for the old ones, but um, and, and then all the stories that you you tell in this universe from the company will will have that data mm-hmm. recognized on their servers, obviously. Yeah, just some sort of well, account with yeah, some kind website. of account or something. Well, that brings me to the ending, actually. Yeah, and the reason why because I think I think they kind of got it. Probably had some fan mail after they made the second one mm-hmm. that people saying, "Hey, why didn't you do it like the first one? Hey, what happened to Taylor? That kind of stuff." Yeah. Because in this one, it felt like they were just. Almost like they were doing it just to shut people up. Yeah. And the ending was pretty much, Taylor's gone forever. <laughs> he can never come back. Deal with it. Let us move on to something else. Essentially, do you want to describe the ending and your well, experience there? Well, it was very meta. Oh, um, it, he goes into a black hole. Yeah. Um, and it was very much, by the way, you had no choice. There wasn't, I can approach this problem in different yeah. ways. It was, this is how you can win. Mm-hmm. Or you you die you lose. He he died a couple of times for me, um, mm-hmm. which felt different from the first one yeah. as, as well. Because I actually saved him the very first time I played. Well, almost uh, I played. I saved him the second time that mm-hmm. I played the the first Lifeline because um, he broke his leg and, and I genuinely felt really guilty that I had I mm-hmm. pushed him too hard and broken his leg and that kind of a thing. None of the choices I made in the second one did I feel guilty about when he died. I went like, well, crap, I got to reload, and I reloaded. And so the sixth or seventh time that I reloaded, I got to the so-called best ending possible. And it even said that. It said, you have reached the best ending possible. And then it gave me an option to put in my email so that I would know whether... And I'm like, wait, what? And it's like, um, this is a pre-recorded message from Tyler. If you're listening to this message, then it probably means that I've been sucked into a black hole and I'm dead and gone forever. Who knows? Maybe I'll return. Maybe I won't. But if you're receiving this, then what you need it to know is that my suit is uh, recording this and will forward yeah, it on to corporate yeah. headquarters. And you can... Re- and I'm just like, <laughs> really? We just did that? We want, we're, we're doing that. Mm-hmm. So... Oh, so you, you're referring specifically to that last message when you say the ending. You don't even mean I don't, the final I don't actually choice mean, with the black hole thing. Because no, I that, thought that was a huge cop-out, too. That was a cop-out, too. But if it had ended at that point, and then I'd had this contemplative moment of, wow, he's gone forever, and that had just been it, I probably would have been okay with it. But the fact that it when, then got meta and pulled me, just it, there was no fourth wall. Mm-hmm. And it just completely broke down all the narrative and said, and, and please send us money because we're going to make more games. And I was just like, really? It really did feel disconnected from the rest of the experience. It did. And I, that I agree with. Um, but getting back to the actual ending with the whole black hole thing, what kind of irked me with, oh, you send, he, he has to drive fly the ship into a black hole to get rid of all the creatures that mm-hmm. are on the ship and all that. He's going to be the hero at the end and save the day. Great. Um 
in all the Choose Your Own Adventure games, I, I mean, the Choose Your Own Adventure books that I remember playing, they gave you different ways to approach the ending. And so maybe oh, yeah. you got the best ending, maybe you didn't, but you got an ending that felt like it was the best that you could have made with your possible choices. Yeah, I mean, maybe that, there was something true. that, yeah, there was maybe something that you felt disappointed in that maybe, you, oh, I wish I had done that instead. But it still felt like this was your choice. This was the, this was the path that it led you to. Mm-hmm. This game felt very much, you have to go this way, you have to end up here, or you're going to lose. It didn't feel like you're really making a choice. I mean, if there's only if your only two choices or are succeed or game over, it's not really a choice. Yeah. You're just and trying to learn how to win. The binary nature of it is problematic, but what it sounds like to me is that they were kind of... This might have been a bit of a knee-jerk overreaction to the first one not feeling like it was game-like enough. People might have been saying it's just too much like, oh, well, my choices don't really matter because the endings are going to be A, B, or C, mm-hmm. but like, most of the things don't matter. So this one, it sounds like they have more like... I don't want to call it a puzzle per se, but like a, if you're presented with these two options, you have to choose the right option in order to succeed. I, and I, then that people might be thinking that's more game-like, quote-unquote. I, I don't know who those people are, because, I mean, to me, with the choices that they, that they well, choices and quotation marks that they gave, it didn't even feel, a lot of them didn't even feel like there was a, oh, you need to understand the answer. Some of them just felt like almost random mm. like oh do yeah. i want to stay in stay in my in my cabin or go to the meeting of people showing up oh i'll just stay in my cabin well okay but then if you do you're now locked into this path where no matter what you do you will th- the the bad guys will show up and yeah, kill you and right. there's and you have a few choices after that but no matter what you do because you made that earlier choice which really had no there was no there was no reason you could have you could not have known this was the way to not there die. was no clue there was no, no clue narrative um yeah, there was really no narrative hook to let you know this is a right choice or a bad choice. You're not making moral choices. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. guessing. You're just absolutely guessing. Gotcha. That's that's right. That's, and that's exactly it. And, and I died that time, to get out of it Because I did that. Because the first time I did that. I never that. made that choice. Yeah, I made that choice because I was like, oh, well, I'll just stay in my cabin. And I could see making a choice like that and having it like set you up to like make things more difficult. Like You really should have gone this way if you wanted to have yeah. an easy yeah. time of it. But to make it so that it's inevitably going to lead to defeat mm-hmm. is problematic. Yeah. And I tried. I went back and went to the... There was like two other choices between that and mm-hmm. i went back and i tried the other one and both of them led me to the same i remember in the first one getting the painkillers um and whether or not to take them it was actually a really dramatic decision should i take one no yeah i should no i shouldn't right we get to the painkillers in this one he's like uh no i probably shouldn't take them they didn't really do me much good down on the planet did they <laughs> it was like this completely meta moment mm-hmm. and there were a couple of times whenever he was making his typical joking reference 20th century joke references mm-hmm. you know about pop culture and, and he actually apologizes for the joke. Mm. He says, I know this is really obscure and derivative, but if you got this joke, you know, and I'm like, well, I, I did get the joke. Are you insulting me? What is what's going on? Are you trolling me now? Is my game trolling me? Um, so, yeah, um, I have a lot of hope for other games that are coming out. I really enjoyed the second one. The first one was amazing. Didn't like the third one. Um, but you know what? That doesn't mean I'm going to give up on the, on the company. Yeah, or the or the style. I want to see more of this. I'd like to see more that are taking a lot more inspiration from the CYOA yeah. books mm-hmm. and really have a lot of these very different choices and branching stories. Well, I have a different rant about that, but we don't have enough time. This of time. course. Yeah. But we'll stick a pen in that one. Okay, we'll stick a pen <laughs> in it. But the, the point of it is that the CYOA mm-hmm. uh, are not true unto their own universe. Those endings actually... Correct. And in, in, in you take choice A, the witch is a witch. You take choice B, she's actually a nice mm-hmm. old lady and not a witch. But I, but I think that's a great way to go to go about it. Oh, I don't think the modern audience can handle it. You don't <laughs> think so? No. So we'll come back to that one later. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion... Okay, so I guess we're going to move on to our meaty topic. Mm-hmm. And so speaking of the modern audience, <laughs> yeah, speaking of the modern audience, we're going to screw those guys. Screw I'm those going guys. Home. <laughs> um, yeah, I, we, I've been we've been thinking we just sort of kind of came out of a, a talk that I was I was considering Metroid and um, Super Metroid and how many indie games are taking after that that style of what they often refer to as Metroidvania, which I think is kind of a misnomer. What most people mean when they say that is actually a Metroid-like or a Metroid clone. Yeah. Um, specifically a Super Metroid clone. The Just because later on, Castlevania with Symphony of the Night decided to take after Metroid 
Does it mean that? And it would be considered a Metroidvania because it literally was a melding of Castlevania and Metroid. Blowing but, my mind right now. Right, but most <laughs> of the games that are called Metroidvanias are actually not taking any inspiration from, even from Symphony of the Night. Most of them are just taking inspiration from Super Metroid. Yeah. Some of them do, but most of them don't. So the name kind of has lost a lot of meaning along the way. But what I'm getting at is this. it sort of led to this broader talk and this broader discussion about... Um, retro games in general, because obviously Super Metroid is an old game. Games that copy that style in a, in a manner of speaking are trying to be retro, at least from a gameplay perspective. Yeah. When we think of retro games, though, a lot of times what we're talking about isn't even gameplay. We're talking about, or at least what most people don't think about, um, they're talking about a game that tries to have um, 2D pixel graphics, yeah. um, a game that, that has, say... Um, the sort of, uh, oh, I, I, I lost the, a chip tune, like a chip tune mm-hmm. style soundtrack. Yeah. Um, we're, we're talking about sort of the, uh, the aesthetic qualities and not necessarily the gameplay qualities. And so I guess the first question to ask y'all would be, is this necessarily correct? I mean, can a game be, be retro in terms of aesthetics, but not in gameplay and vice versa? Or do they have to have both? I would say very much so. Um, basically the, which, the, the former, oh, the former, the former that, it can it can look retro and not play retro. It can also look modern and play retro. Mm. Um, and in a sense, if you want to look at it this way, think about all the new um, Mario games that have come out recently, the 2D side-scrolling ones. Mm-hmm. They even call it New mm-hmm. Super Mario Bros. They, yes, they've updated things, and they've modernized a few things, but for the most part, the gameplay is actually very specifically designed to take after the original Marios. And so, in a oh, sense, those games that statement. <laughs> are retro games, even yeah. though they look modern. This is a huge pet peeve for me. A huge pet peeve. So I will attempt to to not rant and and summarize instead. <laughs> um, I, I will start with this point: if in the eighties we could have made modern games, we would have. Well, now that I'm not necessarily. I'm not so sure that's true. It, it, or define what you mean by modern games. What I mean is, if we could have made them not look pixelated, okay, that we I could have made them um, not flat in 2D, if we could have made... In other words, the more... We've been pushing towards the more realistic, probably since about 2008, which I think was the flashover point. Um, and, and I also think that there's a really important element here of our TVs have gotten bigger. True. Because our TVs have gotten bigger, we can see it better. Because We, we talked about this in the in the, head, the head-to-head ga- uh, episode, where we're like, the irony is our TVs are finally big enough to do head-to-head games, and we're not using them for oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But um, the, the truth is, I had, I had a, a massive TV when I was a kid. It was enormous. It was 20 inches big. Wow. I know, right? And <laughs> we're talking, you know, we're talking the old ratio. The, the three, four, four by three. Four by three. Yeah. I will say, as, as part of what you're saying, Doc, I don't necessarily think that because it, it almost sounds like you're suggesting that there's not there's not merit to a 2D game or there's not merit to a game that isn't realistic. No, that's not what I'm and saying I at all. And I would disagree with that. I don't necessarily think that. But, but what I'm what I'm saying is that the reasons why we did the things we did in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s were because we were trying to push it as far as we could and we were becoming really, really innovated because of our, our, our limitations. Yes, and that was the point I was going so, to make as so, well. So having 16 colors forces you to be really innovative with your art. And because yeah. of that, you can have some really fantastic side effects of that. Okay, so here's where my pet peeve comes in. I, I'm kind of failing at not preaching here. <laughs> uh, the pet I think peeve, I know where you're going with this. The, oh, good. Um, you can tell me if you do. Uh, <laughs> the, the pet peeve comes in whenever we try to emulate the wrong thing from retro. Mm-hmm. See, the the idea behind the, the games back then were, let's make the best game we can with what we have. Right. Now, it's... It, and, and this is not everybody, but in some cases, it's, you know what? It's going to be a lot easier if we just make this pixelated. So let's just call it retro and, and shove some crap graphics on it and, and yes, ship and it I, and yes. label it retro. Okay, so and it'll be great. So we're going to have to address quickly an anticipated objection. Which that, is? That it, pixel art is not nearly mm-hmm. as easy as people make it out to be. Well, that's very well no, true. no, no, no. That's very true. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think that's actually sort of what, what Doc is, is kind of implying. Yeah. Because what people do is they'll think, oh, um, I'll, it's so much easier to do pixel art. Mm-hmm than 3D, so I'm going to go ahead and do it in pixel art, but but they cut all these corners and they end up making something that looks like crap. Exactly. And they think that's okay because they go, well, it's retro. Thanks, Jim. Right. <laughs> you got my back on this one. But I that's, appreciate but that. But that's not true. It's actually like to do pixel art, depending on your limitations too, because you can do pixel art that looks uh, very much almost like someone 
did like an animated drawing or something. Oh yeah, some talking beautiful, right? Mm. I'm talking about some of the very very late era pixel art stuff was yeah was almost like a drawing. So mm. you could do that. That of course obviously they didn't really have many pixel limitations. I'm, so we're talking about more like um, eight bit or sixteen bit. I think mm -hmm, is kind mm -hmm. of where we're looking. And there were a lot of a lot of tricks that they would use with their with their limitations both of um, the size of sprites and also color that they in order to create graphics that one you could tell you could differentiate the environment you yeah. could different you could tell what your character was versus the environment and two so that they actually you could still have good graphics back then there were mm -hmm. games with good graphics games with bad graphics yeah nowadays especially there's this one pixel style and I'm not going to name games but you all know exactly what I'm talking about where. They try to make everything look kind of spindly and um, use just a few little graphics. They don't really have very many details. Mm -hmm. A few pixels, rather. Very, very sort of minimalist. Yes, yeah. like a minimalist kind of pixelated look. Mm -hmm. And that it's, it almost always looks like crap mm -hmm. because because you really there's not a whole lot you can do there. So you're just sort of making something pixelated because it's easy. And your excuse then is, well, it's retro, so you can't really insult the graphics. Right. Mm -hmm. And, that, and you know, you know, style I'm talking about. Yeah, and, and yeah, absolutely. It, there's this game, for example, I played, and and I thought that some of the gameplay that they had in it, some of the choices were interesting, but I thought the art sucked. And you guys might disagree with me, but I'm talking about uh, Sword and Sorcery, uh, Sword and Sorcery. Is that what it's called? <laughs> you um, played that game? I, I think I might know the one you're talking about. I haven't played it though. Because it when, when was it from? What year was it from? Uh, maybe five years ago. It was okay. going around in school when we were we were at UTD. Oh, okay. Is that the um, one with like the really like tall pixel people, like yes. long legs, long yes. arms? It looks. Bad. And it was a choice. I get it. It was a choice. Mm. But this is not good pixel art. If this game came out back in, in you know, like the 16-bit era, I don't think the 8-bit era could have handled it just because of the color choice. Yeah, but if it had come out not. in, like, the 16-bit era or, like, you know, 32-bit era or something like the PS1, it, people would have shit on it for having bad graphics mm. because it does have bad graphics. It, at best, they might have said it was stylized, which I think some people would still argue today. They actually like the style. Well, that's what I said. It, you, people will make that argument, mm. but... I'm going to come out and say it's crap. And you can feel feel free to disagree. I'm just saying, to me, it looks like crap. Well, we have established that you're usually wrong, Jim. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think I'm... <laughs> he agreed with me I earlier. I'm usually <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but I think... Do you think that it was like... Did you think the graphics were good? <sighs> You see, like, there, in cases like and that... And you agree with me, I can tell. You're just trying to be political. political. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not trying to be political, because the good-bad argument never occurred to me. It always just occurred to me that... I will say that I'm not a fan of the choice. Art, there you go. And is it an appropriate choice? Maybe, but the, art, the, the point is that art is very subjective. Obviously, some people probably like it, and that's fine. It's but it, it, it did get a reaction out of me. The reaction is I thought it sucked. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, hey, it was successful because it got a reaction. Yeah. That's what you want. You don't want someone to look at it and go, "Oh, okay," and then just move on with their life and not have any mm -hmm. reaction. So like, in that my, my sense, initial reaction was like, "It looks kind of cool. I kind of like the style, but I like the sound. The use of sound in that game was mm -hmm. brilliant." The sound yeah. was awesome, but the but the I'm talking specific. And by the way, the sound could not have been done on modern on all those old systems. Oh, that's anyway. a different pet peeve. I'll rant on that in a minute. Yeah, well, that and that the the way that they they sometimes will mix. You mean like symphonic or modern sound with when they're trying to be retro? Stick a pen in it. I'll come okay. back to it in a minute. <laughs> the other thing though is that there's also games that will try to be. Uh, maybe we should should we move on to gameplay, or do you want to talk a little bit about the music? No, go ahead. Okay, because there there are games that that look like they're retro games, but the gameplay clearly is not inspired by older games. You mean you, you use more than three buttons? No. To play it? No. no. It's not It's not even a, a thing with buttons. I don't think... I think you can use more, more, more buttons and still be retro, because there were a lot of games that could be very innovative and different with buttons because of arcades. You mm -hmm. could have... You could create an arcade cabinet and have a lot of extra buttons if you need to. I'll give you that, yeah. Um, you could also have different control methods, like trackballs back in the day, or... Very true. Um, those large, you know, like DDR pads or something where you're jumping on giant, you know, glowing... Uh, blocks mm -hmm, essentially. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of different things that you could do with control methods. I'm talking more about um, having things like lots of tutorials in the game, having um, in an action game, having lots of dialogue boxes pop up and talk to you all the time, mm. giving you tips in the middle of the game. These were all things that we didn't do back in the day because you were sort it, you were expected to figure things out through the gameplay, true, yeah. and the way that the levels were designed were supposed to teach you how to play the game. Yeah. And the only thing else that you had was you had a little bit of help, maybe, in the manual. 
Mm-hmm. And maybe you had a little bit of extra. What's a storage. manual? Yeah, it's this old thing. It's this thing so, you use with your hands. Yeah, that's a, great. Life's like a baby's toy. <laughs> yes, and to use a to use a game, and I'm I, I am having a lot of trouble reading this game. But I know we talked about it because I did a whole article on it for Back of the Paddle before we uh, switched formats. Um, it's uh, oh geez, um, it was very similar to Rastan, the old arcade game. It was like you're a Viking person and you throw these spears. You remember this game? You have a sword. Um, it was very good, but it it. it very much had a retro feel. It's extremely hard. Volgar the Viking. There we go. So, uh, yeah, so Volgar the Viking um, was a game that it, it had, it's gra- graphically, it was sort of this, not even 16 bit, it felt more like, uh, you know, like 32 bit, like it could have been on like a, P- a PS1 mm-hmm. sort of platformer, but, um, or action, action platformer. And it very much had that arcade style of you have to learn how to interact with the environment, you have to learn through sometimes even trial and error to figure out. Um, how you're going to approach different obstacles. It was almost like a 2D Dark Souls. Um, that actually sounds amazing. So it, it did a great... I actually really enjoyed it. The game kicked my butt constantly, but it was a very fun game. So it's a game that did retro right, but that's kind of what I'm getting at. A lot of the game, the, the, these gameplay aspects, there's many of them that they look like a retro game, but they have these tutorials, or they have you know their version of a cutscene, or they have... Dot, they have too much text in a game that is an action game. Mm-hmm. It's one thing if you're doing that if, if it's like meant to be an old style RPG, but we're talking about an action game here. You shouldn't, in, you shouldn't be going that route. In technical terms, that's called out of game information. Mm-hmm. Um, anytime it says, "Hey, press X right now to do the thing," <laughs> that's that's out of game information and it breaks form. So, especially if if you have a controller, even if you have a lot of buttons, you should be teaching people how to do these things. In the game itself. Well, that gets back to the Metroid Let them play around with it. doesn't it? Yes, I it mean, does. That, that's exactly the, the, the complaint that you had of, of Other M. Mm-hmm. Is it, it, should, it should be intuitive. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's a gap, I need to jump it. Yeah. Once you've learned that vocabulary of jumping, um, then that is a part of your vocabulary. Um, if it's not in your vocabulary... This is, this is what the, I have problems with games like... Uh, you, you spend, you're, you're, in, you're in third person or first person or something like that, and you run around, and then suddenly... Three hours into the game, you have to drive your first car, or you have your first chase uh, in in third person or something. And the mechanics fundamentally change, yeah. and it's really hard. I hate it when games yeah. do that. Well, and and that, and a lot of a lot of games that have these tutorials. This is like kind of a modern thing, so it's a little bit of an offshoot. But some re- some quote retro games will try to do this. When games have a tutorial, they seem to get in this mode of, oh, I don't need to, to create uh, challenges that are can be solved intuitively by the player, mm-hmm. because I've already told them, taught them how to do it in a tutorial. So what actually happens is they think that they're giving you all this help, and they're, and and therefore they're saving themselves the trouble of, of having these intuitive challenges, but what actually happens is it ends up making the game frustrating. Like, for example, in Other M, the ver- one of the very first scenes, um, you, you have, you're forced to go, right when you land on the spaceship, you are forced to go into first-person mode, and you're, you're forced to scan an object. It doesn't tell you what this object is. Now, I know how to scan, mm-hmm. but... The game just assumes, oh, they're going to know what they're supposed to scan because we've already been, you know, we don't need it. We've already given them tutorials on how to, how to scan. Mm-hmm. So they're going to know what to scan. No, I don't know what to scan. What am I supposed to be looking for in this place? Right. And I sit there for five freaking minutes trying to find, going around pixel by pixel until I find what it is that I'm supposed to scan. And it was mm-hmm. like it was like a little logo on the ship. Why is that interesting to me? There's a glowing door off to my side, literally a glowing door <laughs> off, to, off to my right-hand side, and I'm trying to... To, to scan this because I'm yeah. thinking, what makes the most sense that they want you to scan? In, Glowing door mm. or some small object in the background that is that is like on a gray background and is like faded in, into in it. In Prime, and I forget if they did this in other M, but in Prime they would have like little like objects of interest. Yeah, no, Prime did a great job. Well, job lots of it. games do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, lighting is probably the number one way of, mm-hmm. of guiding someone through a level. Right. Mm-hmm. Even something that's a non-linear level, you can guide them through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I played for hours and hours and hours of Mad Max recently, and one of the things that was great about Mad Max, even though was this post-apocalyptic, rusty, falling apart world, is every time there was a thing to climb or crawl through or, or something like that, a ladder, whatever, it always had yellow paint on it. Old, crusty, yellow paint. So you saw that, that glint of yellow, mm-hmm. even if it was just subconscious, you, you knew you could squeeze through it, climb yeah. up it, whatever. And, and games have been doing that since since the beginning. Yeah. Go back to retro. Visual cues. Legend of Zelda had the little cracks in the wall. Yes. So you go, oh, I can bomb this wall. Now, of course, some of them didn't have the cracks. That was a trick. And yeah. some of them some of them had fake walls that you could like walk through. Right. But the point is, they used visual cl- uh, clues. Well, and that's part of the, the teaching. Is even <laughs> Even walls that you can't walk through, 
you can walk through if you have the right thing. And so it was teaching you the, the vocabulary, again, right, back to that, right. of, look, not all doors are, are obvious. And once you have that notion, then you can go to the idea of walking through walls and, and other things, you know, blowing up walls that don't have cracks and things mm-hmm. like that. So an interesting uh, thing I'd recommend checking out if you guys haven't seen it um, is the series on YouTube called Sequelitis. It's by uh, Ego Raptor Aaron Hansen. Yes, um, no, I've, I've heard of it. Yes, and he I've seen, I've seen the, the ones in particular that come to mind as we're talking about this stuff is one he talks about Mega Man, um, and then he talks about um, Ocarina of Time versus uh, Link to the Past. Oh, great! Um, and so. The Link to the Past Ocarina of Time one uh, was very controversial because he was kind of um, crapping, and a lot of it is for comedic value. He doesn't feel as strongly as he comes across mm. in the mm. video. Was he crapping on Ocarina of Time? Yes, he was. Oh, I like this guy. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> um, he was talking about like all these little things that as they were modernizing, quote-unquote, they added more needless text, and they added like more things you have to wait for mm. you know, in order to mm-hmm. like, pad the time, mm-hmm. whereas he would you know, he, he liked the style of retro stuff better, very clearly. Yeah. Um, also, he talked about in Mega Man the idea of the first level teaching you how to use the key abilities of the game um, without actually it telling you how to use it. Um, and so those are two very interesting examples and very well presented examples of how these older games would do things differently from the way we have today. Um, so I definitely recommend checking that out if you haven't seen it. Did, was he the one that did, there was a video that was going around for a while about how Super Mario Brothers would be made today. Um, I believe I showed it in one of my when I was teaching one, uh, class, and no, that sounds know. wonderful. And it's basically it's um, it's we all know it's a very, very famous example of teaching um, through um, the level design. The first level, yeah. The first level in, in Mario World One One, mm-hmm. um, but this version of it was so you start the game. There's this little like text that pops up like "Welcome to Super Mario Bros. World One One," mm-hmm. and like push push right to walk forward and then as you go forward then it's like there's like the enemy coming it's like push A to jump off yeah. the enemies it's like just yeah. telling you how to this, do everything this wasn't that was an ego similar rapper, to that but, okay. uh, but I, I've not seen that it sounds humorous it sounds amazing it's really funny yeah. yeah, and they but they do that. They basically it just kind of essentially just tells you how to do it. And like, click and to be it. fair, that is a modern expectation that has been built into the modern vocabulary by a lot of gamers who don't bother to read instructions or don't want to take the time to learn things. You probably what ends up happening is you do QA testing or you do focus testing with people, and especially like if you're trying to cater to lowest common denominator, you have a lot of people who are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here, so you have to spell it out very clearly for but, them. So you don't have to. That what they should what they should say is, oh, I don't know what to do here. Okay, well you. Well, you have, let's say you have four buttons. You have four buttons. Play around with the buttons. It's not It's not like you're giving them a keyboard that has like 60 buttons on it, and you're going, um, okay, so I'm not going to tell you what any of these buttons do. Go. Yeah. You're giving them a, con- like you have a controller, and you only have a, a few a few buttons with Now, obviously, there's there's an extra element of that, too. There's conventions within each game. That's yeah, the other absolutely. part of it, too. Like, if you've played one first-person shooter... You generally know how they, on a PC, let's say, yeah. you generally know how they play. You're going to have your mouse, and you're going to use your mouse to aim, and then you're going to, to have probably WASD to walk, mm-hmm. move around, and there's going to be a few different examples with key bindings, and you might open up the menu and figure out what certain things are, mm-hmm. but you generally know, you, you click one of your mouse mouse buttons to shoot, the other one might be reload, or it might be to like shoot something else, or it might be jump, or space might be jump. There's slight differences here and there, but you're generally going to be able to figure out how to control it if you've played one or two first-person shooters. Yeah, it's a so, standard vocabulary. Right, and there's and that's throughout a lot of games, and the same thing can be said about platformers. Problem is, a lot of these companies, and maybe this is from focus group testing, I don't know, they have this this notion of, well, they're not going to know what to do unless we tell them. There, There is an assumption that people make nowadays that if you're playing this game, it could very well be the first game you're playing. And that being the case, I don't think, even if that is the case, I don't think you need to have to be this overt and instructional because for example Super Mario Brothers 1 the original Super Mario Brothers was the first game that a lot of people played Mm -hmm. and they didn't tell you how to play Mm -hmm. so you just start the game and you play there's a little bit of extra extra information if you if you felt you needed it in the instruction manual I never picked I didn't pick up the instruction manual until after I was already playing the game yeah I didn't care so all on all these old games on these systems they they weren't expecting people to read the instruction manual they just had it there as extra help in case you needed it. You seek it out if you need it. So I'm not necessarily against them putting that information in the game if they want to, but it should be optional, and you should have to seek it out. It shouldn't be forced upon you. Mm -hmm. There's a couple things I blame for that, actually, Mm. and we've talked about all of them in the past and recently. The first thing that I blame for it is autosave. 
Oh yeah, you're always moving forward in a video game. There's there's a percent completion meter, and you never go back to that first initial stage again. Yes. Um, with Mario, you fail, you restart. You fail, you restart at the very beginning. You know, that's that's well the beginning of the stage. That's what I but mean. Yes. Well, no, even I mean once you've had all your lives. Yes. You once you've had all your lives. Yes. But yes. but the point is, you know, you. If you had that kind of a tutorial, it would it would get really old really fast. The second thing that I blame is exactly what we were talking about just a few weeks ago, which is the idea of nobody sits on the couch and plays next to their friend anymore. And and if if you came over to my house, Jim, and you're mm-hmm. like, I'm like, hey man, I want you to see this really great new game. It's called Super Mario Brothers. No, no, no. You need to you need to push left. No, jump. It's the A button. Hit hit jump. You can stomp on that thing. That it'll die. Um, now you can jump over that, but don't fall in the pit. You'll die if you. Do. Mm-hmm. That's totally the way we played those things. Mm-hmm. I mean, eight years old. This is this is me with all my you know, kid you know, friends and, hanging around. And and I do think, and that's because I had a very different experience. Actually, I mean, I did. There were games that I played later when I got older. Mm-hmm. Some of them that I played with other people, but for the most part, it was me figuring it out. And you know, if my sister was watching me play the games, I might help her, but I had to figure it all out myself. Well, sure. So I had a very kind of a different experience there, I guess. Um, but. I do, I do kind of want to go back to that point about them teaching you inside the game. Uh, a, a, an example of this, I know you haven't played some of the earlier Metroid games, but specifically from the original Metroid. And this goes back to that gaming vocabulary you were talking about. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so back in those days, in a game that, it, that appears to be a platformer action game, the assumption by the player is, I need to walk to my right and just keep walking. Right. Right at the screen, and just keep going, and I want to eventually get through the level and the stages and all this. So, now in Metroid, instead of, like, giving you any sort of, like, remember to explore the world, and you can go backwards and forwards, and... No, mm-hmm. it just, you just start the game. So what's the first thing you do when you start the game? You walk right, and you keep walking, and you come across some enemies, and you, like, shoot through a door, and you walk a little bit farther, and you get to, and you, you go a few screens, like, actually several screens forward, and then you get to this point where there is this, um sort of, like, rocky environment thing, this low-hanging where there's this very small, like, um, Mm one-block-sized gap at the bottom. Yeah, I think you try... I think you're able to jump over it, but, like, you can't jump that high. Like, there's the gap that suggests you should be able to jump that high. No, 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 that's that's a different part, actually. I'm gonna get to that. This is is to the right. Mm -hmm. So, there is this small part where where the only way you can get through, by the way, is the morph ball, Mm -hmm. is where I'm gonna get this. Yeah, the point I was making is, I forget if you could jump over it or not, but the, the thing that you find, though, is that there is a gap at the bottom that you can't fit into. Yes. And that much makes you go left. Yes, that's what I'm getting at. Right. Yeah. So you get there, you see an enemy come through. You know, well, the enemy can get through. Why can't I? I have nowhere else to go. So you just decide, I guess i got to go back the other way. So you go back all the way the other way until you get back to where you started from. And Which is pretty in- innovative itself. Exactly. You're going left? Wow, right. this is nuts. And you're kind of confused now. You're like, mm-hmm. what's going on here? I guess I'll keep going. You go a little bit further. That's where you get to the part where you where there is that little gap at the top that you were talking about, Chris. Mm-hmm. That's where you have to jump up. You can barely make it up there. Mm-hmm. You jump up. You fall down this little hole. And now you're trapped in this space because you can't get back anymore. Mm-hmm. But there's this glowing little ball over there. Oh, right, yeah. So you you're go, get back. what's this? hmm, I guess I'll step on it because it's glowing and I literally am trapped in a small alcove. So you jump on it and now you gain this new ability and you st- it starts you out with the ability. So you, you, you sort of learn, oh, I can go up, down, that's going to put me into the morph ball. And now you fl- go back through the little hole and now, yeah. of course, you've now learned that's what several things. Yeah. So this teaches you, this, this little segment, which probably takes you about, if you're the first time playing, it could take you as long as 10 minutes to get through. Sure, but yeah. If it's not, it might, you know, it might take you only a couple minutes. But first time, it might take you 10 minutes to figure all this out. But you've learned several, several important, uh, a lot of important information here. One, uh, you understand. Okay, if I see something glowing or some little thing up on a pedestal, That's it's a power probably up. a power up. I'm going to learn something new. This game is going to teach me all these new cool things that I couldn't do before. So I got to be on the lookout for this. Two, um, just because I see something or, or part of my environment that I can't possibly get through, doesn't necessarily mean that I'll never be able to get through it. Doesn't That's necessarily right. mean I have to find another way around it. It means maybe I need a power up to get through it. Um, and three. I'm going to have to do a lot of backtracking in this game. Mm-hmm. Just be- I saw this room before. doesn't mean I'm done with this room. A lot of games back then, if you get beyond a certain point, you're basically oh, you're done. done with yeah. that area. Not in this game. You now have, you've learned, I'm going to have to, I can go forward, I can do exploring, but then I'm going to come to a point where I can't advance anymore. I might have to go back and look right. somewhere else. And all of that was taught to you without a freaking tutorial coming up mm-hmm. saying, hey, you can go re- left or right. <laughs> you must look for power up and collect power up and then press down button to get through. You don't need to. And why did I not have to tell you, by the way, that you needed to press the down button? Well, one, it starts you as a morph ball. So now you're like, you're, you're like I don't know what to do. Oh, okay, I push up and now I'm no longer a morph ball. And then two, your natural inclination when you see something small in a game like that is to say, hey, can I duck under it? Right. So then you do, and instead of ducking, you turn into a ball. 
So it's all very... It, they play around with what you already know, and they subvert your, your, your initial impressions and your initial um, expectations, and it teaches you something new, multiple things new. Mm-hmm. That's retro. That is what retro games did, and a lot of these games that, that seem to be or purport to be retro are trying to basically put a retro coat of paint on a modern game. Ah, this leads me to my second rant. It's perfect timing. <laughs> All right, here's the thing. I think that this current generation, uh, out of no fault of their own, of young gamers, thinks they know what retro is without having played any actual old games mm-hmm. because they're playing all these neo-retro games. Uh, now I'm over here shaking my head. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Just I've seen big smiles see. on both these guys. <laughs> Beards are nodding. Um, yeah, no, and here's the thing. I'm not even talking about bad games. I'm talking about great games. Yeah. Really fantastic games that you and I would love to play. They have really smooth, really fantastic controls. They're beautiful use of retro graphics. They have that retro feel. They don't have any pop-ups. None of that stuff, right? And it's, it's a really well-done game. And yet... Oh, no, I totally get retro. I understand retro. No, you don't understand <laughs> retro until you have played Altered Beast yeah. and actually, actually gotten to the third level. Until you, <laughs> until, you, until you play a game where you can transform into a werewolf creature and you're constantly kicking the enemies in the nards, yeah. you don't understand retro. Yeah. Sonic Unleashed? <laughs> until you have screamed because the battery died in the cartridge. You have not played retro Mm -hmm. until you realize what it means to play for four hours and then die and have to start over. You have not played retro. And sometimes it's not a bad thing. No, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need to. But that's the point is that until you have beaten a game without looking at the Internet for the answer, you have not played retro. Yeah. No, I think those are are some very good points. And and I... That kind of, the internet point you made at the end kind of adds in this extra element of, mm. can you design a retro game that is about, that tr- it has, for example, exploration elements mm-hmm. and elements of trying to, to learn your environment? Mm-hmm. Can you do that nowadays and have people not look at the internet and just find your answer in like a few seconds? Arguably oh, roguelikes, so. because if you procedurally generate the dungeon itself, there's no guide that says go left, go oh, right, but there's, go up. There's still a guide for the rooms. Right, that's true. and we can also have a whole other discussion about the problems with procedural generation, but that's mm. another... That's, yeah. Let's stick a, let's stick a yeah. pin on that, because I can rant about... There's a, good, there's a right way and a wrong way to do procedural generation, and very few people do it the right way. Mm. But we need a back talk on that one, because we did that a couple of weeks ago with yeah. Isaac and... Uh, well, well they, thought, they did say they only scratched the surface, so we'll just have to do another I one. I thought part. most so of this, this is going to be a part yeah. two, that's true. Yeah. I yeah. thought a lot of what they talked about was, um, like, graphics and trees and we did. that sort of... We did, which is why so, we need a part two. Yeah, less th- so the level design. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. But we did, we did touch on it. Yeah, yeah. but no, that was a great episode. If you, if you missed the, the procedural generation episode with Alex and Isaac, they... Did go, they mention Diablo at mm-hmm. all? I think we did. You better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think okay. we did. I'll have a little rant on y'all not mentioning Diablo. <laughs> there we go. That one does it right. Uh, so, yeah, um, two, yes. two main rants from the doc today, <laughs> and, and that is, um, you don't know retro if you're playing modern retro likes. And so, as we kind of wind this episode down, there's a couple of things I'd like to sort of get your guys' thoughts on. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is that I personally believe that there's some things about retro gaming that I don't miss. For example, having to start the entire game over again if I die too many times. I agree. That's something I enjoyed as a kid. As an adult, I don't have time for it. I assume Jim's going to disagree with that. Well, the reason why... Now, of course, there's always personal taste. Well, here's the reason I disagree. It's it's for certain games, I think it makes sense to have save save features or or autosave at the start of a level or something like that. But it depends on the kind of game that you're making. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you're playing. If you're playing, for example, a shmup, a shoot-em-up game, something that that is in the vein of, like, Gradius or Life Force... Those sort of games, the whole point of that game is to try to get to, through the game, through the end of the level, through, say, like... They usually don't have that many stages is kind of where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. So if you know what you're doing in, in a game like Radius or Life Force, you can beat the entire game in about 15, oh, 20 yeah. minutes. That's how you get speed runs. With They're right. kind of arcade-like. So, yeah. Well, it is, specifically. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Those sort of games, if you have save points, it, it breaks that mm. the entire sure. structure of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, But now, if we're talking about something like um, Super Mario Brothers. You could argue that unless you use warps to play through all of Super Mario Brothers, every single level, all the way from one to eight, is mm-hmm. going to take too long to where you actually kind of need to have some sort of a save feature or mm-hmm. something or a password system yeah. or something because otherwise it's 
it, you're, no one's going to want to do it. You're not going to want to sit there because I I've never I have never sat down in one sitting and played and I beat Super, Super Mario Brothers many times. Mm -hmm. I have never sat in one sitting and played all of Super Mario Brothers. Mm -hmm. Not once, all the way through. Sure. Not, now I have beaten the game all the way through mm -hmm. because I've used warps. Mm -hmm. But I haven't played through World One, Two, Three, I all the way through. I understand the designation. You see, you're yeah. Saying. Yes. Yes. I mean, and I'm sure someone has done it, but I, I, I bet you if they've done it, it's taken them probably like two hours at least. Yeah. Maybe maybe more, maybe three. I'm not even sure. I don't really have. I don't have the desire to play a game like that that long. Not anymore. Yeah. But when I was twelve, I did. I didn't do it when I was twelve either. I used warps. That's what I'm saying. But I used warps too. But when I was twelve, I had the desire to play. For long stretches, what I would find as an adult to be very tedious and that's, boring. That's true. And I think also there, that element as well, it's just to say that all retro games, because that's not even true, plenty of retro games didn't have that, oh, you play until mm -hmm. you die. Things like, I mean, some of the games we talked about now, Metroid, the original Metroid, had a password system. Right, yeah. And Super Metroid, a lot, of, a lot of SNES games too, had save systems. And Legend of Zelda, the original one, was one of the very few games on the NES that had its own battery pack that mm -hmm. let you save the game. It was amazing. So you weren't expected to beat that game in one try. So so let's not let's not pretend that save systems mm -hmm. are, are anti retro. Yeah, yeah. Per and se, it's the auto save it's the auto save system of you're gonna save and you're gonna like if oops, if I die, I get to go back five minutes. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if I die, I may have lost twenty to thirty minutes. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between yes. retro and modern. And this kind of brings me back to the point that I want to ask you guys about because I think that a lot of people associate certain things with what retro is, whether it be the graphics or the lack of tutorials or um the lack of saves or the difficulty even. Sometimes people think that if it's difficult it's retro because retro is always difficult. Which is not also but, not always exactly. Exactly. That's that's true. Goes, that's, that goes that's, back to people not yeah, like yeah, you're saying exactly. not, exactly. not knowing retro misconceptions. Games. Um, and so, like, for example, with tutorials, I personally think that there are ways to do tutorials in a more modern way that's kind of acceptable. Like, you allow the the user to say whether or not they do need help. Or you do things that kind of, like, you know, if they if they get stuck in a place, maybe you give them a while to figure See, it out and then sort of give them a prompt I, or something and I'll, like that. And I'll respond by this, and, and, this, and this, you guys may totally disagree with me, mm -hmm. but in my opinion... If your game is designed in such a way that you need it to tell to give a tutorial to the player so they understand how to play your game, you have failed as a designer. And and you don't mean I an integrated tutorial. You mean an overt game yes. fourth wall breaking of course. out of game yes. tutorial. Yes, yes. An integrated tutorial is the way that you should be doing it. You should, they should be learning based on the environment, the environmental clue, clues. Learn as you go. Based on the level design, etc. If you have yeah. to overtly give the meta information like Press the X button to do this. Or, hey, have you tried doing this? If you have to do something like that, an actual what we normally consider a tutorial, mm -hmm. you have failed as a designer. And y'all, free to disagree, but that's my personal opinion. Actually, I agree with you. Uh, and, and I think of, um, for example, uh, newer entries like, like Fallout, right? You mm -hmm. get your Fallout 4. Um, whenever you learn a new thing, there's a little video that pops up um, and, and, and tells you about that particular perk or something mm -hmm. like that. Or, or even Bioshock, Bi Bioshock like yeah. is a great one. Those, yeah. I mean, those videos were brilliant. You know, it's like, freeze your foes, then hit them and they will shatter. You know? I thought that was pretty clever. It actually. was amazing. So, oh, you know, I, I think that that way to do it is the right, uh, one of the right ways to do it. If I you think, need to be yeah, crunchy. I think it. that way is, for me, very borderline. Mm -hmm. I would, that would, that's like, almost steps into that category of like the cardinal sin of being too overt but but it's 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 a sketchy it kind of depends on what you're trying to show it's them also and not it's all needed. at once and, and that's too. important too that's very important. it doesn't yeah. come at the beginning very it's important. not all at once and it's not uh 20 minutes of okay now i'm done with the tutorial it's i've been playing this game for six hours i just picked up a new plasmid i don't know what it does mm -hmm. i'm gonna watch this little 20 second thing that shows, shows me what it does this is great i I have telekinesis now. Whoa! Right? Um, so that, that's a whole different feeling to me. And so, and that's like one of the ways that, like, you know, I think you can do it right or better. Um, but then I think that there's still, like, I don't think that you failed as a designer because sometimes people just are new enough to games or new enough to the system or something that they just need a little bit of help. They need, it's, it's more accessible to people. Now, sometimes you can hold their hands too much, but I also don't want to ignore people who might need a little bit of extra See, help. And, and to go back to that, too, I think. I mean, I understand where you're coming from with, oh, what, what if these people need help? But my initial thought on that is, as someone who grew up playing games who was a young child and didn't know any of this stuff, mm -hmm. I was able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I have a very hard time thinking that someone else won't be able to figure it out if you design your game correctly. That's where I'm... So, yes. I am with you on that. I really believe... I, I firmly believe that. I think sometimes uh, modern designers coddle their players too much, and they, they think... They have very low expectations about them, I should say. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's something I run into, honestly, with, with the company that I met where 
you know, designing educational software for kids. They have mm-hmm. this, we have this very low, I have to keep constantly pushing back on, mm-hmm. on them when they say, well, you know, these kids are struggling to do math, so we have to make sure that we show them how to... Well, hold on, though. They, they know technology, and just because they may not understand a math concept doesn't mean that they're stupid and doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they can't figure things out. If you, if you let them figure it out for themselves, they're going to retain this information longer and learn it longer. Mm-hmm. So it's this constant battling back and forth. And I think that's going on with a lot of designers, too. They have people like focus groups and say, well, I didn't understand this right away. I got frustrated. Well, okay. But if you, if you bought the game or played the game, you might take some more time to figure out how to play it. And mm-hmm. maybe if you're the sort of person that gets frustrated within a, a few minutes from your game, maybe A... Your, your core design philosophy for this game might be wrong. Mm-hmm. At the core, you might have done something wrong where you have created a situation where the player can't figure it out unless you overtly tell them something, so you failed as a designer. Or two, the person that you have brought into your focus group has no desire to figure this out because <laughs> they are... No, it's just, They're not they invested. May, they may not, or they may not be your audience, quite frankly. Yeah, that's yeah, the other I'm thing. Kidding. They may not be your audience. Your game doesn't have to appeal to everyone, and I think that's something that, that retro games understood. It was... Or maybe it may possibly... And I'm talking about old old games, rather understood. Maybe not, almost maybe not on an overt level, but they understood. Hey, we're making we're making video games. Even Nintendo back in the day was trying to make their games more accessible, but they're trying to make their games more accessible to people that are willing to play video games. Yeah. Whereas some people nowadays have this impression of we're we're like the movie industry, and any and anyone can play this game, or anyone should be able to play this game. Well, maybe if they if they if they want to, if they want to put in the effort and play the game, sure. But if they just want to sit down and have an experience where they're just watching someone do something for them because the game practically plays itself, that's not really a video game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think there's. And too I definitely much of think. I definitely on. think there is. There are definitely cases where they do go too far with it, and so I think finding that right balance and again kind of doing it right. But that's a totally different discussion. But but like Dark uh, Souls, for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I haven't been a big fan of Dark Souls. I've and that's a game that I I'd like to try again because I think it seems to do these things that I like, and yet. I get Every time frustrated. I try to play it, I well, I think one of the reasons I get frustrated, honestly, is that it's a 3D action game, mm-hmm. and I don't honestly like 3D action games mm-hmm. that much. Mm-hmm. If it was a 2D game, I'd probably play the hell out oh, of it. Oh, that's funny. Um, or if it was another type of 3D game, but because of the type of game it is, yeah. it, and that that could be a big part. Well, that that remind everything you just said yeah. reminded me of um, something we didn't talk about with Bioshock, which mm-hmm. is that it actually has a dynamic tutorial system yes. where if you haven't done a thing in a while. It, it just has a little scroll along the bottom that reminds you, um, hey, remember, if you hit this button, you can do this thing. Um, yeah. you, you can block your attacks. You, mm-hmm. you can, and that's, that's kind you of can do a about. wheel. Yeah. You can, and I think and that's it's, a great it's, compromise because... Right. It's, it's not intrusive. Right. It doesn't feel intrusive. And every time it pops up, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's right. Because you're not using that. Mm-hmm. But... Um, yeah, very quickly to wrap, though, I just kind of want your thought. Give, given that we have so many different like misconceptions of retro is and isn't, what is it that you guys think retro is? Very quickly, that we can say that is maybe not even specifically what is retro, but what is retro that's worth preserving, and what is retro kind of like as we can apply it to a oh, modern... Wow, those are very different questions. I mean, yeah. those are all very... <laughs> I, I think what's worth preserving, like we were saying, is this idea of letting gamers learn through... The design of the game, through the level design, through the way that enemies are approaching you. Um, so, as, in other words, give your give your players credit and let them figure things out. Because a, a big thing that has, I think, been a cornerstone of the video game industry from the very, very start, from the early days in the arcades, is challenge. Mm-hmm. And if your game, in order for your game to have challenge, you have to, and, and also learning, you have to feel challenged, and you have to be learning new things as you play through the game, so that you feel like when it's over, that you've accomplished mm-hmm. something. And so I think that is is something from retro, a lesson from retro, mm-hmm. that I think should be applied to modern games. Mm-hmm. It should be applied to these these retro indie games that we've... Yeah, but, but also with a sense of past. flow in mind, too, where you're not challenging to the point of over overly being frustrated. Flow theory? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. There is a balance there. Mm-hmm. My, my answer is um, something I alluded to before... And it's the idea of setting limitations. For example, graphics. Mm. We're going to do this with 16-bit graphics. Or, um, or, or sound. We're going to do this with a certain you know, sound limitations. Whatever it is. Um, we're going to limit it to four buttons. And then excelling. Doing the absolute best that you can within the context of those limitations. In other words, be innovative because of the limitations. Mm-hmm. And so if we're going to look at the examples of the games that have been really, truly innovative, like Zelda. Why was Zelda innovative? Well, it was because within that context, you could go up, down, left, or right on the screen, 
and you could return to where you went before, and it was an exploring game. Mm -hmm. And that was the innovation. So let's set a limitation of, of graphics, maybe, but then let's do some, some truly fantastic things with those 8-bit, 16-bit, you know, 32-bit graphics, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and if, if we're going to... And colors, too. I mean, that's another limitation right, right, that right, I right. think a lot of these indie games will... Uh, they're trying to be retro. They'll break the color limitations. Mm -hmm. And then, it, then it, it's less impressive what you've done because mm -hmm. you're not really sticking to their limitations. Which gets me back to Pet Peeve 2, yeah. which mm -hmm. is you don't know retro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and on that note, um, before I kind of make my final point, um, there's actually a really interesting um, bit of reading you can do about the making of Shovel Knight. Um, because they were... I still haven't played that one. Yeah. Yeah, um, I still need to play that game, actually. It's, it's a retro-style game done pretty well. Um, I've seen a lot more of it than I've actually played, but it definitely feels retro when I've played it. Um, and it also has a very retro look, a very retro sound. Now, they actually talk about some of the ways where they did break some of the traditional limits of the NES. Um, so they talked about, like, okay, we... we or like, for instance, they originally wanted to have um, sprite flickering. To give you that Ness feel. But then they found that that didn't fit the design very well. It's distracting. It doesn't work as well on HD screens. And so they decided to take out sprite flickering. So like things like that, they actually they do a really good job, I think, of talking about the ways in which they broke the limits that the original that hardware makes sense had, to me. but sure. still set their own. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I think is also very retro that I think is worth keeping, and some games still do this, um, but letting you have a kind of openness about the way you play the game. Um, even the simplest of games where you've got like up, down, left, right, two buttons, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. still let you approach certain problems in different ways or let you sort of play with your own style. Whereas I think a lot of games nowadays, like even if linearity isn't a problem, yeah. which I don't think it necessarily is, but they kind of want you to play a game this specific way to the point where it's almost like you could just tell someone go forward, press A, B, X, Y, because that's the sequence of jump, grab, you know, jump off, whatever. Right. I, I actually, that's actually a great point because mm -hmm. I, I it was even thinking back to like Super Mario brothers how you know as you're going forward if you see say a hammer brother on some of these blocks you can either try to jump underneath it you can run below to get past it mm -hmm. you can go up but go up another wait for it to jump on the higher one and then then step on it you could get really close and let him keep throwing his hammers above you until he le jumps up and then go behind him mm -hmm. you have all these options for how you approach these challenges in the game and mm -hmm. you're right a lot of modern games especially with um, enemies and trying to trying to like enemy patterns mm -hmm. and stuff. It's very much oh wait for him to do this and then do this. Mm -hmm. They almost give you like here's your tool set and you're going to be like one tool that you're supposed to use on this one enemy and that's the only tool the tool that will work. And we gave you that tool so you can deal with this one enemy. Yeah. Whereas you kind of want this one enemy that can be tackled in a bunch of different ways by several of your different tools. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we kind of go back to having a little bit more openness and more moment to moment choice for the player because choice and consequence is something that really gives you a sense of investment and it makes you feel like you're or doing something yeah. in the game. And figuring out those puzzles on your own, I think, is a big part of what fun is. And so if we can get back to more choice, more consequence, more learning, as you said, Jim, um, I think we're going to have a lot more fun in our games. And I think that that's, if you kind of pull anything from retro, maybe fun is the thing to pull from it. Yeah. Tim Schafer said steal, but steal the right thing. Yeah. I think he stole that. I'm pretty sure he did. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for our Backward Compatible Podcast number 61. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm hungry. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.